So in this screencast, we're going to introduce energy and enthalpy. So energy, in its most basic form, is the capacity to do work. We are going to talk about just two different major forms of energy, or energy transfer. But all energy is sort of broken down into two very broad categories. And those categories, or flavors I like to call them, are potential energy. Potential energy is the energy due to composition, position, position or condition. So we think about you know, a book up on a shelf as potential energy. If I push it off and drop it on my cat, it will hurt my cat. Or if I drop an egg, if I push the egg off the counter, the egg on the counter has some potential energy. When I push it off, it falls and cracks open the egg. Then there is kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. It's a little bit more easy for everybody to understand that as something is moving, it has a certain amount of energy, and if it hits, you know, if my VW bug crashes into a brick wall, it converts the kinetic energy into other forms of energy and breaks down the wall. And the formula for kinetic energy is one half mv squared, where m is the mass and v is the velocity squared. Now that one half mv squared is going to sort of help us remember what the unit, the metric unit for energy is, the SI unit for energy. So if you remember the equation that kinetic energy is one half mv squared and we know that the SI unit for mass is the kilogram and velocity is a compound unit, a distance per unit time and the SI unit for velocity then is the SI unit for distance which is meter divided by the SI unit for time which is second so we have to square that velocity unit so that tells us that the SI units for energy are the kilogram meter squared per second squared. We're going to be dealing with energy a whole lot and so scientists have come up with a nice uh, one letter or one word description of the unit that is kilogram meter squared per second squared and that's the SI unit for joules. So the SI unit for energy is the joule. Every time you see a joule you can think oh kilogram meter squared per second squared. Are you responsible for knowing this equation? Yes. But if you remember this equation, you should be okay and just sort of derive it on the fly like I just did. So the way we're going to talk about sort of energy exchange, which is what the, the crux of this whole discussion is, is we're doing lots of chemical reactions and there's energy going from hither to yon. So, so where the energy is going is usually being exchanged between the system and the surroundings. And the easiest way to think about it is that the system and the surroundings, and you push that all together and that's everything, the entire universe. Now obviously the surroundings that we're going to concern ourselves with are just sort of the local surroundings and the system is sort of the thing that we're talking about. So the system might be the beaker or the stick of dynamite or the flask or whatever and the surroundings is sort of like the air and the laboratory around it. So everything has a certain amount of internal energy which is given the symbol E which is the total energy contained in the system. So the total internal energy, all the potential energy, all the kinetic energy, every ounce of energy that is in our particular system. Now, the problem with internal energy is that it's pretty much impossible to measure. But what we do measure is changes in internal energy. That's actually relatively easy. And one of our, one of the energy transfers that we're going to talk about, the one that we're going to talk about the most, is, is heat energy. And so before we can actually talk about that, we have to introduce a concept called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which I know is kind of silly and I won't bore you with the story as to why we have a zeroth law of thermodynamics. If you want, you can go and research that on your own. But suffice it to say, we have to say it. And the zeroth law of thermodynamics basically says that hot things dump energy to cold things when in contact. So if I take a hot poker and I put it into a bucket of water, what happens is the hot poker, which is my system, will dump that energy to the surroundings, which is the cold water, and it will keep dumping energy all by itself. I don't have to do anything. It does it all by itself until everything becomes the same temperature. And the other important thing before we get deep into our discussion of energy transfer is what is known as the first law of thermodynamics, which says it comes in various forms, but the one we care about is that energy cannot be created nor destroyed only transferred between system and surroundings. So what this basically says is if my system loses five joules of energy, that means my surroundings must gain exactly five joules of energy. If my system 
gains 15 joules of energy. That means my surroundings lost 15 joules of energy. The total amount of the en energy in the universe must be constant. Because if that wasn't true, well, I mean, we have lots of evidence that it is true, but if it wasn't true, um, we couldn't do pretty much all the calculations that we're going to do here real soon. So again, there's two forms of energy transfer that we're going to talk about. We'll talk about one for you know most of the semester, and the other one we're really going to talk about for a slide or so. So the big one is what is known as heat. And heat, as, as we define it, is energy transfer by a difference in temperature. So again, exploiting the zeroth law of thermodynamics that says hot things dump energy to cold things. So the act of one thing sort of losing heat energy to another. A hot thing goes down in temperature, a cold thing increases in temperature. And again, here's our universe, here's our system and our surroundings. And depending on which way the energy is going, we have a name for that energy exchange. So if the surroundings is heating up the system, so the surroundings getting colder, the system's getting warmer, we call that an endothermic. Uh, the biologists call this ender endergonic, I believe. So whenever you have a heat transfer from the surrounding to the system, we call that endothermic. When we have an energy transfer from the system going to the surroundings, so the system is the hot thing, dumping energy to the surroundings. We call that exothermic. There's an easy way to remember which one of these is which, um, and that is the word explosion. It starts with the letters EX, and most people would admit that an explosion, the stick of dynamite is our system, and when we set off the dynamite, it dumps energy to the surroundings, heat energy to the surroundings. The other form of energy transfer that we just need to sort of talk about in passing um, is what's known as work and work energy is uh, another another way of transferring energy in or out of the system, and it's usually what's called pressure volume work. And its ninth grade definition is force times a distance. And the easiest way to explain the concept of work is by thinking about a very simple uh, system where this is a a car, a piston, and a car engine. So here I have my gasoline vapor. There's my spark plug, and here I have a movable piston, and the pressure on this side is maybe one atmosphere of gas, just some atmospheric pressure on this side, and the piston will move such that to a point where the pressures on both sides are the same. So here I have my gasoline vapor, and then I set off my spark plug, and then what happens is all that explodes, and I get a much greater pressure, and what happens is the piston then moves down by some certain amount of volume, and it changes the volume. There's an increase in the volume and that little delta simply means change in. Change in, that little, that little delta, we're going to see that a lot, you need to understand that anytime you see a delta that just means change in whatever comes after the delta. So delta smiley face is whatever the final value of the smiley face is minus the initial value of the smiley face. So whenever you have a change in volume, it could be a negative volume or a positive volume depending on which direction it's going. So this is an increase in the volume. So if I wanted to calculate the amount of work that was done by the explosion of the gasoline, I could sort of calculate knowing what the pressure is and multiply it by this change in volume. And so all you need to understand at this point is that work is just another form of energy. And again, work is, is an energy transfer that is usually more in the realms of physics because they do a lot of forces and such. And in chemistry land, we don't deal much with work, all of our energy transfers, and we have just as many just as many energy transfers as physics does, but ours are almost exclusively uh, of the heat variety. So here we can think of our change in energy of our system. That's supposed to be a Y, playing Microsoft. Change energy of our system. Again, this is our change in internal energy. And I had indicated that the absolute internal energy is hard to measure, but the change in internal energy, that we can do. So the change in internal energy is the heat of the reaction plus the work. Q is our heat of reaction, and W is our work. And we have to have what is known as a sign convention that tells us which, because these have a positive or a negative value. And so we have to understand, we have to be able to talk about, you know, is the heat of reaction positive or negative? Is work positive or negative? 
and the direction is what tells us what the sign is. So we call this like a sign convention. So the easiest way to think about it is our, here's our system. And if the system loses energy, it's, so the system is giving off, it's an exothermic reaction that's losing heat, we say that the Q is less than zero, that the, you can sort of, that, that the sign of Q is negative. And the reason why we have to talk about this is there are going to be times when you're doing calculations and such where you have to willy-nilly, out of the blue, change the sign on the system. So make 12 joules and turn it into negative 12 joules with nothing else other than this sign convention telling you you have to change the sign. That's okay. That's why we need to understand it. So the system is losing energy and we, by convention, say that Q is less than zero. And the way to think about it is, is that if the system is sort of losing heat energy, its amount of sort of heat potential energy is going down. So it's final heat energy, stored heat energy minus its initial heat energy would actually be negative. That's why we had this sign convention. If we sort of think of Q as sort of a, a delta E of system, it would end up being negative. So if Q is less than zero, that's an exothermic reaction. And then by extension, if it's an endothermic reaction, the system is gaining heat energy, so Q is positive. And we also have a similar sign convention on work that if work, if the system is doing work on the surroundings, the sign of W will be less than zero. And if work is done by the surroundings on the system, then the sign of work will be greater than zero. So last couple of definitional things. Um, a state function uh, is a function of state. I know that's silly, but that's what it is. It's a function or property whose value depends only on the present state or condition of the system, not on the path used to arrive at that condition. So what all that means is you're, you're familiar with this concept. It's basically, okay, here's a measured property of a, of a system. And when I measure it, it doesn't matter sort of what were the conditions before I measured it. So for example, here's a glass of water. The temperature of this glass of water, I take the temperature of this glass of water, it doesn't make any difference you know, I'd say it's 25 degrees. It doesn't make any difference that last night it was 15 degrees because I kept it in the refrigerator or that I had it outside and it was got to be 35 degrees out in the sun. It doesn't matter when I'm measuring the 25 degrees. I only care about the temperature is 25 degrees. I don't care about the other conditions or the previous conditions. Same with volume or pressure or even density of this sample of water. So just a last little bit of math to get us to something more useful. So we know that delta E is Q plus W, so the heat of reaction plus the work. And recall that work is equal to the pressure volume product, but work is less than zero when done by the system, so we're gonna have to, we're gonna drop in this P delta V and account for the sign, and this is a Q sub P, so that's heat of, heat of reaction at constant pressure. So heat of reaction at constant pressure, that's supposed to be P is equal to delta E plus P delta V. All we're doing is just rearranging the math here. And we get enthalpy change is equal to delta H plus Q, or is equal to Q sub P is equal to delta E plus P delta V. What? What? So here's Q sub P, right? That's heat of reaction at constant pressure. We are defining this is a triple equal sign. We are defining delta H of reaction as the heat of reaction, which is equal to delta E plus P delta V. All we need to sort of establish here is sort of what this equation means. We are going to refer to delta H from pretty much from here on out. When we refer to how much energy is given off in a reaction or how much is absorbed in a reaction, we are going to care about delta H. You're going to see delta H all over the place. And all you need to sort of recognize is that delta H is a heat of reaction. Heat of reaction at constant pressure. How much energy is associated with this reaction? It's just our measure of heat. Delta H, heat of reaction. So enthalpy is a state function, and we know that means that it is, it doesn't matter how we got there. And it's also an extensive property. If you'll recall, an extensive property is something where the value of it is a function of how much you have. So the way you remember that is, since this, this is a delta H of reaction, that how much, so it's like we're thinking about heat energy or think of an explosion. Uh, how much energy is given off is a function of how much dynamite I blow up. 